Hello and welcome. I'd like to welcome everyone to this session of RoboLaunch. We're delighted to have Simon Lucy joining us in person. And to introduce Simon, uh, Joel, would you like to join us? Hello, everyone. My name is Joel Julen, and I'm a senior computer science student from the University of Pittsburgh, who is from Western Pennsylvania. This summer, as part of the Robotics Institute Summer Scholar Program, I am conducting research on neural radiance fields. Today, my colleague Vihan and myself will facilitate questions from our fellow scholars that are in person with us today and those that are joining us online. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Dr. Simon Lucy. Dr. Lucy is a professor in the School of Computer Science at the University of Adelaide and is the current director of the university's 140 member Australian Institute of Machine Learning. Prior to this, Dr. Lucy was a research professor here at the Robotics Institute where he led and still currently leads the CI2CV Computer Vision Lab. This past year, I had the opportunity to intern at his CI2CV Computer Vision Lab. From both Dr. Lucy and one of his students, I gained valuable experience and exposure to the field. In addition to contributing to my personal journey in robotics, he has also made significant contributions to geometric reasoning, autonomous vehicles, object tracking, mobile computer vision, and automated facial analysis. Throughout his notable career, Dr. Lucy has served on high profile editorial positions for journals and area chair on numerous occasions for main conferences within the field of computer vision. Thank you for speaking at this Rebel Launch session, Dr. Lucy, we all look forward to your talk. Thanks so much for that kind introduction, Joel. Um, I probably couldn't have done a better job myself. Um, so thank you so much. And it's been a lot of fun interacting with Joel over the last couple of months. And I look forward to um, hopefully having a little bit of a chat with all you guys. And um, I know you guys feel, probably already feel that you're in such a privileged position being at the summer school. Um, so it's, uh, and it's something that sort of I've known um, for quite some time since my time here at CMU. And Rachel and John do such a great job of sort of like mentoring you guys and getting that next wave of talent through to not just to CMU, but to the rest of the world. And so it's um, really exciting to be out the front of the next wave of brilliant minds coming through robotics. So um, today I'm here to be telling you about all the big advances in robotics. I'm going to list off every single one of them because I know what all the advances in robotics are. OK, so just hold on to your seat. So but in seriously, um, seriously, seriously, um, Robotics is such a big field now, it's really hard to even sometimes even define what robotics is. Um, so you come to the Robotics Institute and you've got people doing advanced machine learning, you've got people doing computer vision, you've got people doing um, sort of field robotics, you've got people doing haptics. Um, and so what's really exciting, I think, is robotics is touching every aspect of our lives. It's a driver for the economy. It's a driver for society. And so you guys are sort of like this link between sort of the promise of robotics and the Robotics Institute's been around for a while. It's been around since well before most of you guys were born, 1979. Um, but um, for a long time, it was started with this idea of a promise for what robotics could be delivered to society. And I really feel that we're at this inflection point. So you guys are coming into robotics at an amazing time where we're really gonna start seeing the benefits of that dream, seeing it applied to many, many aspects. And so I'm super excited for you guys. In many ways, I wish I had frozen myself and waited another 10, 20 years, but it's fun to kind of chat to you guys here. So um, yeah, and so basically in reality, what this is, is I'm gonna give you guys a couple of little things about secrets that I think, and not really secrets, they're things that I actually, if anyone's ever worked with me, it's really difficult to shut me up. So there's very few secrets around, but they're just things that I've learned over my career that hopefully um, you guys find helpful and um, hopefully you guys um, can gain some benefit from. Um, and this is the bane of my existence. Where to put Zoom things? Is it going to, let's try down here. There. All right. <laughs> and we'll move this one. Yeah. Right. The minus sign on the video. The minus sign? Which one's that? Oh, okay. All right. Everything will disappear. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it, but that's still there. All right. Um, all right. We'll just keep going. Um, trust me, there's some really informative titles at the top there. Um, <laughs> so um, challenges for robotics research. So um, that's one thing we're going to be talking about really, really briefly. Um, another thing I'm going to talk about is just basically a lot of you guys here because you're interested in research, right? Researching robotics. And a lot of the time, I kind of think back to when I started out 
And the thing I'm amazed by is how little I knew, but having that passion, that energy. And so what I want to do too is a little bit calm everyone down a little bit, because I think when everyone kind of comes in, they get very, very panicked. Um, I'm sure John can relate. I used to teach the graduate course here at Com in computer vision. And the first couple of weeks after that, you see a lot of students is coming to me and they're, they're panicked. They're panicked about finding the right supervisor, getting the right topic, making sure that they're choosing the right thing. Very, very, very um, panicked. And in reality, there's no need to be panicked. Okay. Maybe a little bit panicked, but um, what I wanted to do is that, but you don't have to be severely panicked. And so I want to kind of calm you guys down a little bit with that. Um, and then also um, I want to talk about um, some stuff that, um, we've been doing, Joel and I have been doing with some of my group, something called implicit neural functions. And so we have, if we have time, we're going to talk about some of the geeky stuff in my group and how it applies to robotics. And so, um, and, and sort of some of that, some of the exciting things that are going on there. One kind of fun thing with this sort of stuff is unlike many other areas of AI and ML, you don't need to cut down a rainforest to train these types of networks. So um, one thing I think that's very um, difficult for a lot of researchers coming in is the sheer amount of technical expertise and the sheer amount of hardware and compute required to do sort of cutting edge research. And so again, um, I'm gonna show you guys examples of some things that you can actually run on your laptops. And these things that we're running, we're actually getting published in top tier conferences. And so that is sort of a, a nice sort of message to that. You can still do a lot of meaningful work, but you can do it on your laptop. You don't need to have million dollar labs and million dollar equipment to, to have an impact. And so that's another nice message. So um, let's move into the challenges. So um, another sort of feather in my cap too is I'm actually also a principal scientist for Argo AI. So I do a day a week for them. Um, so if you're new to Pittsburgh, you're probably seeing these Argo cars driving around and being here in the US, um, you shouldn't um, batter an eyelid. You're seeing a lot of these cars around having the LiDAR and the cameras and other pieces around. And what's really curious about it, I actually went for a ride in one of them two days ago, that kind of drove past campus here, is they're really starting to start driving like us, right? In many ways, they're better than a lot of drivers. And so that's a real sort of an amazing thing that's happening. And, and again, um, a true sign of a technology being successful is when the youth of a society don't notice it anymore. So what I'm hoping for is sort of like, my, I've got a six-year-old. What I'm hoping for is like 10 years time, he sees an um, that's a sign of a technology being successful. So we're definitely not there yet. And John can testify to how far away we are, but there are exciting things that are happening. And so in robotics perception, um, to make all this stuff a reality, we have to do a lot of things at once, right? So we've got the cameras, we've got the cars, we're trying to kind of detect objects, we're trying to predict velocities, we're forecasting things. And then given the state space of the world, we then basically have to try to do some sort of planning and even control that sort of goes on with that. So really, really, really tough problem, okay? And, but we're making progress. And a lot of this has been driven by this deep learning um, um, revolution. Um, and so uh, we've been kind of seeing sort of ever since the early 2010s, it's a dramatic drop in perception um, in a lot of areas of computer vision. And that's been now translating through to many other areas of AI, like planning, control, natural language. Very, very exciting. But one thing that's interesting about a lot of this AI that's been happening is that they're definitely achieving human-like proficiency, but they're not. So if we have like, if we draw like a plot, this is something I like to do sometimes in my talk. Um, you've got this y-axis that's sort of generic performance. It could be a system playing AlphaGo. It could be an autonomous car trying to run over a teenager. It could be whatever you want. Um, but you've got the performance there in the y-axis. And then you basically got the amount of data here on the x-axis. And this is in log scale. And so what's really crazy, well, one of the things that we're really benefiting from and what a lot of big tech companies are betting on is scale. So basically, if I throw enough data at something, orders of magnitude more data at it, more and more and more and more and more. And once I've got more, more again, I will eventually get up to human-like performance. Okay. And that's what's really driving big parts of the tech economy at the moment, this bet on scale. Scale, 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 scale again. But humans don't learn like that. We don't need terabytes, petabytes of data to learn tasks. So even though we're seeing technology that's sort of getting human-like performance, it's not learning like humans do. 
right? So the example like with an autonomous car is that, oh, and this is like the great example, like hands up, who's heard of GPT-3? Right, most of you guys should have, and DALI-2 and all these things that are making um, um, big impact in the media and people getting, if you follow Twitter, these huge arguments between Gary Marcus and the rest of the world over sort of like, is this, is this AI sentient or is it not? But one of the big things there is that just the sheer cost and effort to actually kind of train these things up. So um, if you trained up GPT-3, one estimate is that it would cost like $4.6 million, not to buy the machines or to buy the patents or to buy the data or to go or to buy the data center. That's simply to train it, right? So imagine a graduate student, you've got one go of training a model. <laughs> got to get it all right. Cause like our budget's like, or imagine if you're a startup, crazy, right? Okay, so, and people, and then you're like, well, their foundation models, Professor Lucy, we can do the, yeah, I get that. But, um, but the thing is, there's a sheer cost that's associated with that. And so, and one thing that people are a little bit worried about is, is it's perhaps acting as a barrier to innovation. So we're kind of like the sheer cost and effort associated with some of these models. Um, and so one thing I think is also interesting is like even in autonomous vehicles, like you've got a teenager that's learning how to drive. They only need about, depends on what jurisdiction you're in, but they only need to run about 75 hours of experience to get on the road, okay? And you contrast that with sort of like companies like Waymo and Cruise and Argo, and um, it's like um, unbelievable what a big gap there is between human and machines in terms of, not in terms of the performance, but the ability to learn from finite data, okay? And so we're entering in this realm now that I think is people are really starting to think about small data learning. Okay, so in many ways, like big data is kind of passe. Big data, everyone's eyes roll back and uh, big data. Um, and you're seeing a lot of stuff like an IEEE spectrum. There's a great article by Andrew Ng around sort of like small data. Um, and the idea there is basically being able to do intelligent things with small amounts of data. And in many ways, that ability is intimately related to what we need in robotics. In robotics, oftentimes, you won't be able to tell a machine ahead of time with huge amounts of data what it's going to be doing. You might only be able to show it a couple of examples. Okay? You might be in a completely different environment. You might be on the moon, you might be on Mars. You need help digging something. You show it a couple of examples and you want the robot to mimic you, adapt, do something with it, only from a small number of examples, just like humans do. Okay? So they're one of the big challenges in robotics at the moment. Um, and so I see sort of one of the goals for this generation is to really make an impact in small data learning. So not just to get to human-like performance, but to give machines the ability to learn like humans do. So then you can drastically expand where they can be applied. So for me, that's the challenge, that's the gauntlet. And you can say that, oh, well, transformer networks or graph attention or coordinate networks or implicit neural functions or deep reinforcement learning, they're the answers. Well, they might be, but in terms of the problem, I think that is um, a, a, a good characterization of some of the challenges that are out there for you guys. Now, that's the challenge and it's broader than that. And I'm well prepared for someone coming up to me and saying, Professor Lucy, you've forgotten this or this and this and, and it's climate change and all the other things that are affecting the world. But um, the big thing is, is that we have to identify where the research challenges are, but then also the issue is how are you gonna make progress on it? In many ways, that's why you're here at CMU. You know, here sort of starry eyed, excited to be here. Um, a million ideas. I remember that. It's a fun time in your life. And so it's something that should be cherished and you should be enjoying. Um, so some secrets. So one thing I noticed in my time at CMU, and I'm sure Rachel and John can um, have seen some more things. I've wandered around campus, like say first or second week of semester. And I see this. <laughs> Don't let this be you. Okay. Um, I think people come here and they say, well, I've got to work hard. Everyone at CMU works hard. That is not going to be the differentiator. It's about working smart. And one way of working smart is not to knock yourself out at a laptop and go to sleep in front of it, right? So, um, so we see a lot of this around campus, especially in Smith Hall. We've seen people like sleeping on laptops and things like that. Um, I don't allow it in my group. People get sent home. Um, don't let it happen to you, okay? Because it's, there's, and the thing is too, is that research is about creativity. It's not about, you're not an accountant, right? You're not sort of balancing ledgers. If you're tired, go home, have a rest. That's where the best creativity comes. You, it's a creative endeavor. 
you need to have well-rested brains. Another kind of um, topic or thing that, what should my research topic be? Students tend to be panicked by this. All right, I need to make sure I get this right research because it's going to define the rest of my life. Like I, I could end up a beggar in the, street, in, in the street or like a trillionaire, if I get my research topic right. And the reality is, and um, I'm sure John can relate to this, but I definitely can, is what I did in my PhD, PhD topic is, is completely different to what I research now. Completely, right? The reality is AI technology is moving so fast now, whatever you choose will most likely be solved in a couple of years. I'm not joking. Right, so like 10, 20, and, and so the nature of being a graduate student now is completely different to what it was a generation ago. Many students could set up a career in robotics, have, they could be doing control theory, they could actually have just a little, little thing in a space of robotics, and that could be their entire career. You wouldn't have to deviate, they just would push away at that. That's completely gone. What's happening is that entire fields are being upended in a couple of years. Problems that was, um, I started out doing work on like face tracking and face analysis. That is like a commodity now. Like no one does research. It's like doing like work in video codecs. It's like no one does that anymore. So getting panicked about what your topic's gonna be is nonsense. What really matters is the lessons and the foundations that you build up on that topic. That's the thing that matters. So as I said, I say this in the, um, in the first class, in my vision class, everyone just, um, yeah. All right. So it's all going to be good and you're in a great place and you're around a lot of great people. So that's that's one sort of message that I like to kind of pass on. Another message is, and don't worry, this isn't my new house in Australia. Um, <laughs> this is um, yeah, this is actually just a message. Um, one thing that I found when I came to CMU and what benefited my career, and it's just a lesson, is always try to be the worst house on the best street. Try to surround yourself with fantastic people. And eventually your value goes up. That's how I felt. When I came to CMU, I said, I don't belong here. I don't know anything. I felt like an imposter. You don't know what you're doing. But I knew that I was in a good place. All right? And you are in a good place. It's very easy to feel like an imposter. It's very easy to feel like you don't belong. But what's great here at CMU is everyone's from everywhere. I kind of felt like you were a part of the... Um, um, the Starship Enterprise when I arrived here, if you're, if you're a bit geeky that way. People just from everywhere, um, all walks of life, all economic backgrounds, completely different countries, completely different languages. And I felt at home. And I hope you guys do too. Um, and it doesn't, and this is a, not just a branding for CMU, any school, any graduate school, when you're applying to graduate school, try to look for that, okay? And then when you're choosing where you're going to go after employment, Try to think about that too. You want to be around good people, okay? Otherwise, you might end up in a house like this. I'm not sure. Um, another question I get a lot is, should I focus on theory or practice? Okay. So, and what I mean by that is sort of like, um, should I be focused on engineering these fantastic systems that beat, beat benchmarks? Um, I can form a startup. Um, I can go out there and I can actually solve real world problems. Or should I go away and I focus on some fundamental theoretical angle of what's happening in the field? Like, like one thing my, my team work on, we work on something called the generaliz generalization paradox in deep learning. One thing, for instance, is no one's really got a good theoretical analysis at the moment over why deep learning systems can memorize data so well, but yet generalize so amazingly well. Because all the theories are broken on that at the moment. Now, is that going to earn you a trillion bucks? No, but it could make real impact on the field. So um, does anyone know who this guy is? And John's not allowed to raise his hand. Does anyone know who this guy is? Who is he? Is that Dr. Kinkin? Very good, yeah. So um, it's a guy called um, Takao Kanade, um, previous director of the Robotics Institute, um, probably one of the most famous roboticists on the planet. Right? And, um, and I was lucky actually, during my time here at CMU, I got to work under him. And I asked him the same question. That's the reason I brought him up. It's sort of like, what should I do? You've had this amazing career um, and he's done everything. He was doing sort of face recognition at the Tokyo World Fair. He's done stuff in um, autonomous vehicles. He's done stuff in fundamental robotics. Um, algorithms that you get taught at computer vision class, like Lucas Kanade, Tomase Kanade. Um, there's so many algorithms with Kanade in them. This guy, 
Um, and I used to ask. 3D reconstruction of the Super Bowl. For the 3D package. reconstruction of the Super Bowl. Um, just um, if you just Google his name, the list goes on. Um, and he's won sort of nearly every award you can think of in the space too. Um, but I asked him once, um, you've had this amazing career and you've done it all. What should I focus on, theory or practice? He kind of said, and he always has a wonderful smile. And he kind of just sort of sat there and he looked at me and he said, Simon, if it's not both, don't do it. <laughs> I'm not joking. If it's not both, don't do it. So what did he mean by that? He meant that basically, if you're doing something very, very engineering, if there's not some sort of little bit of a theoretical bent to it or something new or something under the hood, you probably shouldn't be doing it, okay? But equally, if you're following blind theory and there's no practical use for it whatsoever, you should probably have another rethink about it too. So it's a continuum, but you need to have that balance between the two, okay? And that's something very, very difficult to work out when you're coming in as a graduate student. It's really difficult to kind of work out what that balance should be. Um, another thing, and again, um, I'll actually get to some research in a second, but um, and the message is uh, message here is not to go, don't go and gamble. If you want to go gamble, have, have at it. Um, the um, big thing is, does anyone know what I mean by multicolor research? Yes. Okay. So our entire field is plagued with this sort of um, issue of multicolor research. Basically that um, um, you have a thousand monkeys typing on a thousand typewriters and you're gonna end up with Shakespeare. Um, trying every conceivable configuration, every conceivable setup. The hope that if you just try enough of them, you win the benchmark. And then your professor comes in and says, why did it work? Well, I tried them all and this was the best one. Why is that a bad idea? Because it seems like a lot of the world's doing it. Why is that a bad idea? Any insight that would to it's actually career suicide, right? So like if I'm running a big group, it's probably an okay. If I've got an infinite budget and I'm running a big group, it's okay. But for you individually, it's horrible because the chances of you, you might strike gold once, but the chances of you striking gold two or three or four times have a long-term career, it's infinitesimally small, all right? And so that's one thing that you're gonna learn here um, at CMU as well, is learning how to do principled research. Not to, you have to do engineering, you have to take guesses on things, but you also have to do things in a principled way. And that's going to dramatically increase your likelihood of having impact. Okay, so staying away from Monte Carlo research. Um, I put this one in here because I coach my sons on the six soccer team. So I've seen this happen all the time. Don't follow everyone else. And this is another thing that happens when people are talking about research topics. They're seeing that there's a certain area that's blowing up and it depends on what it is. Like everyone's into transformer networks and graph attention networks at the moment. And so my, my topic has to have something to do with that. Um, now you have to be aware of what everyone else is doing, but it's a real issue. When everyone's falling off the ball, it's really hard to get noticed. And in many ways, it's really hard to have impact. If you're following what everyone else is doing, I, I kind of joke to my guys, we need blue sky. We need an area that's unexplored. That's interesting, but we don't have a lot of people in there yet. Because that's where you can make real progress. Because uh, if you don't, you start sort of chasing yourself and it gets, it gets um, you're following fads. Um, another one, um, I call it, you've heard of ambulance chases. I call it benchmark chases. Okay. You get some groups around the world that are just basically chasing benchmarks. Um, and they're almost like high glycemic index papers, right? You win a benchmark. Everyone piles in and cites your paper. But as soon as you get knocked off the benchmark, guess what happens? No one cites it. Okay. Assume your papers, are, rather than like being candy, they're like roughage, right? They're like vegetables. They get better over time because they're having lasting meaningful impact. That's what you want in your career. Now, don't get me wrong. If you can win a benchmark or two, do it because they're important. But this is another thing that CMU does. At CMU, we define benchmarks. We don't just win. That's the type of thinking you need. It's not cool to win a benchmark. It's way cooler to define it. Like who knows the winner of ImageNet at the moment? Who knows who defined ImageNet? Pepe Lee. Right. Big impact. What makes a good Research question direction. Does anyone know who this is? 
Don't worry, it's not my grandfather. <laughs> um, I'm going to say a name. Does anyone know who Richard Hamming is? Yeah, who's Richard Hamming? Excellent. Yes, so Hamming, he's famous for coding theory. He was at Bell Labs. He was actually at Bell Labs during the time that Shannon was there. He was actually uh, shared a room with Shannon. An amazing guy. And he has, I, I, I included the link here if um, anyone wants to look it up. He's got this great, he gave this great speech about 30 years ago about you and your research. Talks about what it takes to do good research. Okay. And I encourage everyone to kind of have a read of it. I mean, in many ways, it makes what I'm talking about defunct. He does it in a much better way than I do. But one thing that I think is great in what he talks about is that one thing that's really hard for students to learn is taste. And what I mean is taste is not in how you're dressed. If you're looking at me, you can't learn anything from me. Um, but taste is in terms of determining, uh, oftentimes, I, and this is what I think the difference between a PhD and a master's degree is. So a master's degree is typically like you get given a question and you have to go away and find an answer. A PhD is defined by working out what's a good question to ask. And Hamming said that like the fundamental thing as a researcher that you need to be worried about how do you learn to ask good questions? So oftentimes I think graduate students come out of my office thinking about how can I find the answer to Professor Lucy's question? What they should really be thinking about is how did Professor Lucy, or Professor Dolan, know to ask that question? Why does that question matter? There's a billion questions out there. Why should one question answer matter more than another? And that's what you're here to do because if you can learn that, you don't need us. You can go off and have this really, really productive career. And that's fundamentally what you're here to do. It's not to answer questions. It's to ask, to work out how to ask the right questions. And that's the only way that you're going to survive in this current field at the moment. The final thing is, I think there's this view that when you're getting more and more senior in the field, you are not getting involved in coding and other things. You're up in upper management. Right? You're kind of saying, ah, oh, well, well, I'll let the minions do that. I'll, I'll, I'll sit here and stroke my cat and kind of talk about um, these, these, different, th these different aspects. But if you talk to a lot of the top people in the field, um, and I'm going to point to some people. Does anyone know who this is? Who's this? Uh, Dr. Yeah, Red Whitaker, super famous, like um, Red Team, um, doing amazing things, putting robots on the moon. He's even involved in robots at Three Mile Island, um, this amazing career. Um, he's getting his hands dirty every day. He's involved in what's happening. He's involved in what's happening on the robot, um, the system. Um, does anyone know who this is? I'll say Roomba. All right, if you're studying robotics, you've got to know who the people are. So Rodney Brooks, Rodney Brooks, super, super famous um, roboticist. Um, in MIT started um, Roomba. Um, building things, getting curious about how we put things together. Um, Takao Kanade, um, still involved in the math and the coding. Um, a guy called Peter Cork, who um, is a, a very well-known roboticist in Australia. Um, he basically still does his own Python coding, kind of getting, in, getting involved in these pieces. Um, our Dean of Computer Science, Michel Hebert, still writing papers, still being involved in first or second author papers. So as you're getting older, making sure that you're connected to what's going on. Okay, the best people don't sit away from their research, they're involved in. And then finally, um, if you're looking at your research, find what in your problem does not make sense. Okay, and for many of you guys at the beginning, that's probably everything. <laughs> you're going, like, I don't understand any of this. Um, but typically, like something, and you guys are coming in with an advantage that we don't have as older researchers. We oftentimes take everything for granted, but oh yeah, well that works, that works. But when you're coming in, you're looking at a lot of this for the first time. And sometimes the biggest innovations can be found in areas where you're looking at, well, that doesn't make sense. I don't quite get why that works. And having another look at something or a view at something, that can really, really help you. So um, and it won't be easy, but it'll be a lot of fun. And that's the big thing at the end of the day. You're in this really privileged um, position um, and it shouldn't be about making money or starting companies. They're all the things that come on the periphery, it should be about a sense of wonder and be about excited about understanding how we can explore human intelligence and human autonomy. And so that's the big motivation, I think. And if you're having fun, you'll have a great career.
Now, quickly, um, I'm just mapping how, I don't know how much time we've got and things, but um, I can quickly jump into um, have a bit of a Monty Python thing. So something um, completely different. Um, talking about some work that um, Joel and I um, had been involved in, something called implicit neural functions. Um, who's heard of an implicit neural function? Okay, we're learning things, so John's heard, John's heard them. So an implicit neural function, it's an interesting sort of idea. Um, basically what it allows you to do, and it's probably um, um, biggest example is in a technique called neural radiance fields. So what you're seeing here is sort of a continuous GIF of a Christmas tree. And, but this um, video was not collected in reality, it was synthesized. And so they just got like say 10 to 12 images of discrete views. And what they're able to do is they're able to reconstruct the entire radiance field of the scene. So then you can just recast the entire scene. And so, so you get this depth map, you get these other parts out, just from very, very simplistic images. And one reason the community cares about this is autonomous com car companies like Waymo and other car companies are trying to basically build up implicit neural functions of the entire planet. I don't know if you guys are aware of this. Um, so they're basically trying to, this is them doing a nerf of all of San Francisco. And one reason that's cool is you can only ever get a car going down the street a couple of times in a direction. With an implicit neural function, you can go down any street, any time, in any way you want. You can resample the function, right? So all of a sudden, you can kind of see why that's useful because it's extrapolating your data set. So instead of only having a couple of sequences through a street, you can extrapolate to millions of different scenarios. So that's why many people in robotics are very, very excited by this. And it's different to simulation. So in simulation, you need to kind of build things up, like you need to kind of generate up the simulated version of the world, coded up based on a gaming engine. Here, you're sampling the world and simply trying to represent it as a neural function. Right? So if you haven't heard of it, it's common and um, more and more people are thinking about what's, what, what to do with it in robotics. Um, so to give you guys a really kind of high level version of it, and I don't know how much time you guys want me for questions. What, what... Okay, all right. So I'll do five more minutes and then we'll go questions. All right, so, um, so what is a, a coordinate network? What's a radiance field? And Joel's playing with this. So um, if there's any questions that are too difficult for me to answer, I'm gonna pass them over to Joel. Um, so what we'll basically kind of do, so what does the technique do? So what it does is you've got perhaps an image here, see, of a sad tennis ball, and you've got your camera center, and you've got a pixel coordinate, right? And in images, pixel coordinates are simply define rays, right? So that's one way to think about them. They're, you can think about them as positions on your screen, but they're really defining rays that are going out to the 3D world. And so what we're wanting to do, right, is we're wanting to kind of say, well, there's this arbitrary position X, and X is a vector, X, Y, Z. So there's 3D position in there. And what I want to do is I want to feed that X into a neural network, right? which is a bit weird. Typically, we're used to feeding images or sounds or other types of measurements into a neural network. But here, I'm just feeding in the coordinate, okay? So a coordinate in 3D space. And I'm gonna run it through a network and we call this a coordinate network. Um, obviously it's not just a clever name because it accepts coordinates from a signal. And what I'm going to do then is I'm gonna output two things, color and density, volume density. And what I'll do then is I'll apply something known as a differentiable renderer, where I sample all the different X's along this ray and then integrate those values so that can match the color at that point. Okay. So, and so basically what we're trying to do is just from the single image, we're trying to basically represent the radiance field here. But instead of representing the radiance field in a voxel space or sort of in terms of actual examples, I'm gonna code the radiance field as a neural network. Now, what's really cool about this, it's a completely different way of thinking about neural networks. Because probably in all your experience, neural networks have always been to do with transforming signals. Like say I take an image, I run it through a neural network and I get a segmentation now. I've transformed the image from the raw pixels into a segmentation. But with a coordinate network, I'm actually representing the image as a 
as a neural network. So the, the weights themselves aren't transforming the signal, the weights are the signal. So it's a very, very, and so what's cool is that I can literally run a coordinate network on a single image. I've got like a homework in my maths of AI class that I teach in Australia, where we actually spend a couple of weeks playing with neural networks. And the only training data is a single image. That's it, right? Because I think we're getting bogged down in this idea of training with billions of examples. But really there's a lot to be learned by actually looking at what can I do if I'm just training very, very simple functions like images in this way. So what's cool is then you can, obviously one image isn't enough. I can apply this to multiple images. And if I get enough images, I can get a pretty good estimate of this radiance field. And that's what's really amazing. These networks are tapping into what makes deep learning amazing, all right? So I made this statement before, a lot of people are fascinated by deep learning because deep learning can do this amazing trick that no other area of machine learning has been able to do before. It can memorize a signal, but generalize or interpolate really, really well. So before deep learning, we could have extreme versions. I could have say a linear classifier that could generalize really, really well, but could never memorize. I could have a nearest neighbor classifier that could memorize everything in my train set, but would never generalize to unseen examples. Deep learning has sort of opened up this, this amazing trick that no one really understands. If they understand it, they're basically lying or they're probably Yoshua Benji, either one. Um, but um, they're able to interpolate between these views, actually get amazing um, reconstructions of what they're seeing, but generalizing really well. And so um, what you can then do is, um, I'll perhaps skip over this because I'm getting some details over that. But what I can do is I might just jump to some of the, I probably killed my presentation. Ah, all right, that's probably happening too. You know what, that's probably the universe's way of saying, Simon, stop. <laughs> Um, and I'm happy to um, answer, answer any other questions. But uh, um, I did want to see if I could show, yeah, 6% left, I've got my thing there. But I was gonna show maybe one video and then um, we can go from that. But like, this is an example over some of the things you can do here. So um, this is what, um, so this is an example of some of the stuff that we're talking about here being able to interpolate scenes. So this is sort of taken from say five, 10 images of some flowers, and then being able to interpolate any other view you'd like in that, in, in that scene. Dinosaurs, T-Rex. Um, and what's neat too is um, you can get the depth map for free, actually get the depth map out, which is really, really instructive. And, um, and we'll skip over this part. But the other part that's sort of neat too, is um, we can do things on sort of like real, real world scenes like iPhones. And so, yeah, and we call our method, it's called BAF. Um, but the, the other thing that's sort of cool too is that we've been applying these sorts of techniques to LiDAR. And so we've been applying it to things like scene flow, where again, you've got like a car, you've got a LiDAR hit, you've got something that's happened in the next frame. And then basically you can kind of think about how that flow is happening. And it's a, a long-standing problem in autonomous vehicles, but we're using coordinate networks to solve that too. So um, we basically represent the network as a coordinate network. I'll just turn off, finish it off here. So we can actually represent the flow as a, uh, as a coordinate network. And so when you run it through this way, what's really interesting, it's regularizing the solution. So in this problem, instead of representing the neural radiance field, we're actually representing the flow field using a coordinate network. And what's really cool with it, one reason I'm really excited by these things is that these things need no data. So I don't need a terabyte of data offline. So what's very, very interesting is that the architecture of the network itself is the thing that's regularizing the solution rather than the data. And so this is sort of what I'm talking about in terms of small data AI. How can I get sort of like human-like performance when I'm dealing with the small number of, of, of examples that I typically encounter? And so, um, yeah, and I'd be happy to talk offline about that, but I might just wind up there and see if we can, if there are any questions or anything like that. And um, thank you so much for your attention.
So we have our, our colleague Vihan online that will be sharing the questions from the um, chat. And um, so, so uh, yeah, hi, yeah. hello everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm Vihan. I'm also part of the risk cohort working under Dr. Gino in the bot intelligence group. And today I'll be helping uh, Joel with facilitating questions for the session. So the first question from YouTube is uh, general advice for what to do in my master's to be an exceptional PhD candidate. Um, so I would, so that's, a, that's a great question um, and things. So um, I think first off, um, get accepted to grad school. That'd be my first, my, <laughs> so it's, all, it's always a bit awkward um, talking to professors when you're, when, when you're not in. Um, the second thing I think is go in with an open mind. Um, I, I do, I have to admit, I don't know how John feels about this, but I have to admit that sometimes I run into some really energetic students that have almost planned out every little nuance of their grad career. And they even know the topic and exactly what they want to achieve and what they're going to do. And they're steadfast. And so in many ways, those students, I don't want to work with <laughs> um, because in many ways, um, it's a conversation, it's a dance, right? So you have to admit, you have to know what you don't know. So I think, and it comes down to that example of taste, there's a reason that you're at grad school. If you knew everything, you'd just be going out and publishing papers by yourself, right? So going around talking to the different um, professors, definitely kind of seeing what their take is on research and what they like. And we have a great thing here called the marriage process. Um, I don't call it the marriage process anymore. It's, 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 it's <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, um, there is a, um, um, a spiritual blending. I don't know what we can call that. Um, um, but, the, um, but basically what they try to do, it's just a matching of supervisors. And so going around, going in there with an open mind, trying to understand why they're curious about the problem, and also realizing again, not being paralyzed that if I don't get to work on this exact topic, then my career is over, right? Because most likely the thing that you thought in undergrad that was super important, perhaps isn't as important as you think, right? But the passion that you have, and I don't want to discount that, oh, you don't know anything. The passion that you have for the topic, the things that you like, the things that you resonate. So think about what do I like? Do I like doing more mathy stuff? Do I love coding? Do I love to build stuff? They're the things that your supervisors want to know, right? Because the thing that you have the most fun with and the thing that you like the most, that's going to be the easiest because grad school's hard. I mean, everyone has at least a week or two in their life of grad school where they just want to quit. It sucks. Um, some people have, and so we call it the dip. Some people have a longer dip than others, but at CMU generally, we can help you out of the dip. Um, and things. So, but the thing is, you've got to be passionate about it and come up with an open mind. So that would be my advice. Don't be, um, now, um, that's probably bad advice if you're an absolute genius and you're publishing ICRA and CVPR papers before you got it got in. Maybe we can talk, but if you're not doing that, then um, I think you've got to go on with an open mind and listen to the supervisor about why they're interested in the topic that they, they're interested in. Great. Um, any other questions? Uh, yeah, there's another question from YouTube uh, about what do you think about event camera based vision for robotic perception? It's a very, very specific question. So, um, so for those of you in the audience who don't know what event cameras are, event cameras are super, super fast cameras. And um, basically, rather than just capturing light, they're looking for changes in light. So they can really operate at very, very high frame rates. Um, and um, there's a couple of groups around the world doing some really excellent work in that. Um, there is, uh, oh, what's that, sorry? The, 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 um, sorry, can you say that again? I can't hear you. The, uh, I don't know if uh, David Scaramuzzi? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So David, David Scaramuzzi is probably one of the most famous guys in that space. Um, I like it. Um, and there's two reasons I like it. I think that robotics is all about combining sort of um, software intelligence with hardware intelligence. And so anything where you can kind of like buy something in hardware, make it simpler, then you're gonna make your life easier. So, um, and the analogy I have is to say with the object tracking, when I'm tracking an object, I could have a really awesome deep learner that does a great job of tracking, tracking an object, but it might take me a second or two to run the algorithm. And by that time, the object's moved all the way over here. And because the object's moved all the way over here, 
the task is inherently harder. But in hardware, if I can run at 300 or 3000 frames per second, even if I'm running not as sophisticated a network, the object's only probably moved here. And so fundamentally, it's a simpler problem. So you've got this really interesting trade-off that if you can do stuff faster or better in hardware, I perhaps need less intelligence. Right. And so those of you who are curious about this, I had a picture of him up, but Rodney Brooks wrote some very seminal papers and they're like, elephant don't play chess. I think well, the, the, there are a lot of things about sort of like connecting intelligence to basically um, um, the physical body of the robot and balancing those two things together. So anything that touches upon that, I really like. So yes, event cameras are very interesting. Um, whether they're the answer to everything in vision and robotics perception, I'm not sure, because one, one of the drawbacks too, right, is um, we have cell phones and cameras on nearly everyone on the planet. And so to deploy event cameras to everyone, it's hard. So that's the other thing you've got to balance with. Software moves faster than hardware. So kind of balancing those in terms of what you need to do. But um, yeah, it's a, good, it's a good topic. And I think there's lots to do in that space. Do we want to invite any questions from the room? Are there any questions from the room? Um, yes. Um, so we were talking earlier about like finding good questions. Um, when you find like, I guess, if you find multiple good questions, how do you approach narrowing down on where you want to focus on and avoiding like feature three? That's a really good question. So if you're a professor, you just hire more graduate students so, <laughs> so you can do them all. But if you're a graduate student, that's a hard one. Um, and I think the, I think like looking to what startups do. So, so like, um, um, so um, try quickly, fail often. So oftentimes like what you like, so when we set up research problems, right? We kind of have a situation of sort of like, well, if I try something really ambitious that I'm not really sure if it's going to work, I've got to have, have a thought experiment or a simple way of testing that there's something there that doesn't require weeks or months of work. Right, because if it takes you months of setup, and this is a problem in robotics, because sometimes a lot of problems take setup. And so it's balancing that risk. And that's why you need to lean on your supervisor a bit, because getting that, getting that balance right is tricky. But what you don't want to do right is you don't want to do something that's very, very high risk, very, very out there, but it takes maybe five, six months to set up because then it doesn't work and then you're struggling. So, so I think you want to sort of like a move quickly, fail often, or the other thing too, is that if you're pretty sure of an idea, you've tested it out, um, you can actually invest and build on something. Like um, Yasser Sheikh, for instance, he did a great job on this. We've got something called the Panoptic Studio downstairs, which is this huge dome of cameras. It's got like thousands of cameras in there. And it took them almost years to build it, like millions of dollars in putting this together. Now, it was pretty clear that if you built this thing, it's gonna be useful. And so the risk there was, it wasn't sort of a speculative idea saying, well, I don't know, I'm sure if multiple cameras will really help. He kind of knew that if I built that and put that together, that would do that. And that's another example of sort of a CMUism in the terms of defining a benchmark. So that was something a lot of people sort of like have the best algorithm on the Panoptic Studio, but CMU is no one is defining it. And that's what everyone kind of remembers. But um, yeah, so hopefully that was helpful. Thank you. Great. Um, yes. Um, most of the like 3D reconstructions you did from the 2D images were of something that was still, like the dinosaurs in the museum. How does that work if that object is moving when you're capturing it? You, you should know? come to CVPR this year. So that's exactly <laughs> what people are moving into. So it's called dynamic NIF. And so what they're trying to do is you can actually have these neural fields that can, instead of them being fixed in, so at the moment you've got X, Y, and Z going in, but you can feed in X, Y, Z, and T. So it can be a space time field, All right? Uh, but the problem there is that then you need way more samples and views. So how can I additionally regularize the space? But that's essentially it. So you can, that's what's really cool with these coordinate networks. You can actually really scale them up to high dimensions. Cool, but there, but it's still ongoing. There's not. Um, you get way cooler results with rigid scenes than with um, um, than non-rigid. We can ask Joel about that too. He's playing with some ideas there. I just had a quick follow up on this one, Simon. It's interesting. I mean, at the one extreme, we could say when you're trying to use a few data, you have zero data, it's still going to generate a triceratops, but that's not going to happen, right? So 
what what are the limits practically or qualitatively in terms of how much sampling you need to do in you know, a small amount in order to achieve it? So that's a really good um, question. Um, and so um, we've actually been writing a couple of sort of papers that are sort of skirting around that um, or trying to answer that because um, there's this really interesting problem, right? Because essentially these coordinate networks, they can essentially take like continuous signals in. Right? And so there's this idea of sort of like, well, how much information can I store in the network? Because I can have this continuous signal and I can essentially in a continuous signal, I can in theory store almost an infinite amount of data in a continuous signal. Right, because so I, I can just make if I'm storing information, I can just make it. I can make the wiggles tighter and tighter and tighter. To, and I'm not talking about the strain wiggles. I'm actually talking about like in a signal. I can make the change and modulate the signal to be tighter and tighter and tighter. And so, what's the information content that I can have in a neural network? And how do I balance that between how I generalize? And so, it's really connected to actually interpolation theory. And so, basically, kind of, um, it's almost like Shannon Nyquist. So, I've got these samples. How much can I generalize here? And with the radiance fields, the rule of thumb is that basically kind of, I would say for a, a quadrant, like say if you've got sort of like a, a plus or minus 90 degrees in, in, in an area, um, you probably want seven or eight images in a rigid scene to do a good job. And the other thing to it really is interpolation. So it's not extrapolation. So if you go outside the convex hole of the views, you're not all of a sudden gonna be able to predict the back of someone's head because you've seen the front of it. So you can't create information out of nowhere. People are definitely trying to connect mainstream AI, machine learning with these ideas. So there's things called coded NERF, where they actually have sort of um, NERF networks that have been learnt up, and then they have codes that are sort of scene specific. And they can generalize a lot better, but then you start getting um, the, um, perhaps mismatch that if you in, in, uh, encounter a scene you haven't seen before, you get a mismatch in there. But um, it's still open, so we're still trying to work out all the all the all, all the components of that, but it's a great question. Yeah. Um, I'd like to invite a question online. Yes. There's a line there. Yeah, so the next question is from uh, Payam, and they say that uh, earlier during the presentation, you mentioned that students recommended are recommended to surround themselves on the campus with amazing people. But I always thought that coding or programming requires remaining focused and working alone. So could you please elaborate a little more on this? Sure. Um, so I guess the um, that's a good question. Um, and I guess this comes, and again, I'm, I'm full of kind of, I can't believe um, I've, I've got to this point in my career, but I'm full of these cliched sayings. Um, but um, I would say back to the person who asked that question, um, true robotics research doesn't start on the keyboard. It starts on the whiteboard. Right, so you need to be on the whiteboard talking about ideas, kicking around what you're thinking on the whiteboard, then code it up. And I think a lot of people have this view that, um, I mean, there's a lot of coding involved in robotics, do a lot of building things, but at the end of the idea, it's a creative endeavor. And so you've got to start on the whiteboard. So definitely kind of like, once you've got the idea in, um, put your headphones on, sort of um, get your favorite track on Spotify and go at it. But um, talk about your idea before you start. Um, bounce it off on, on, and as I said, good research starts on the whiteboard, not on the keyboard. Okay, uh, so uh, the last question I think is from Ben. Uh, what are some advice that you would give to students thinking of graduate school? Um, do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that, um, I think the level, oh, Oh, right. someone disagrees with me. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the water bottle's going, I went to grad school and did nothing for me. Um, but the, um, so I'd say do it. I think the distinction is, I think you should, I think the world is better for having more graduates. I think what is maybe a better question is, should I just do a master's or should I go and do a PhD? And my kind of question is that, uh, my answer to that is go to the master's and then decide. Um, both are great. Um, you've got lots of great job opportunities. Um, and I think, but I would stand by the distinction that I think I've had a lot of great master's students come through with the ability to ask their own research questions and that's enough. But I do think if you want to go up to that other level um, and really sort of be pushing the envelope on terms of what's happening in the field in general, a PhD is useful. But um, by that means, master students, some of my best students have been master students. So 
Um, there really is no, no divide there. But my categorical thing is, if you're thinking about graduate school, do it. Then if we ask for one more question from the room and then um, have Joel close the session. Sure. Yes. I have a little bit of a clarification question on the small data and specific neural system. Yep. So you see this as a way to like generate more data and then you will use that extra data to like train so I, I think there's two views i have so so and that's a really really good question so one question is um with these implicit neural functions or nerf and things um one application for robotics is definitely sort of being able to create more data and in some ways we've been kind of talking about not thinking about data in terms of bits, but in terms of neurons, because you can actually kind of think about, you can actually then probe continuous signals. You can kind of sample things and do things. And for robotics, I think that's very, very useful. So you get that extra generalization. The other thing I think that's fascinating with implicit neural functions is that it's opening up direction that traditional AI, we are still very much thinking about AI in the classical way that saying, well, how can I make you do perception better? How can I do this better? Like one crazy idea that we're looking at with this type of work is this idea around say a universal codec. So wouldn't it be cool that irrespective of my signal, I could always be able to compress something irrespective. I need to know nothing about the data other than it has some generic types of points. So, so, so one thing, for instance, we're looking at is, and we're talking to Apple about this is wouldn't it be cool to actually generate up a neural radiance field on your phone and compress it really, really densely and then send that over your phone. So actually you can think about, and, and that's one thing I really am interested in people thinking about in terms of neural signal processing. So not just transforming signals, but what can you do with signals if you can represent them as neural weights? So like, would Netflix be streaming the next episode of Stranger Things, not as pixels or H.264, but as a network? Why not? Why do I have to represent signals as bits? Uh, on the next question is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. We have one last question. All right. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, uh, the question is: Can research in robotics exist with without uh, without AI and ML these days? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think that, oh, I mean, it's funny when you're talking to people in an industry, they are very skeptical of a lot of AI and ML um, because they get given the latest shiny paper and it rarely works the way that it's advertised, right? So I think more trusted AI ML, that's less brittle. I think that's what they need. I don't think we're ever going to turn back the clock. I don't think we're ever going to be um, sort of going to a situation where there's no AI and ML in a robot. Um, I mean, you can build it, obviously, there's classical robots there. Um, but I think that we are needing to get to a point where it needs to be less brittle. Um, and I think that's one of the big criticisms of AI, AI ML with robotics. As soon as you get outside a comfort zone or something, it just breaks. And that's why I think a lot of engineers are very skeptical and sort of like, a, like to go back to classical things. Like you'd be surprised in big tech companies how often they're still using Kalman filters. Um, they don't want to use sophisticated forecast models because as soon as the distribution changes, it fails catastrophically, right? And it's one of the reasons that people still like using LIDAR, right? With LIDAR, they're still using ICP um, and just some very, very simple navigation parts. So, there are some, and, and that's the other part that you guys are going to be getting. You need to be grounded in both classical robotics and modern robotics because it, the, the final solutions that you will need would need to be a mix of both. And it's really dependent upon the data portfolio that you have. If you've got very little data, um, it's very difficult for you to be able to apply AIML. Wonderful. Thank you. Sure. We're now going to conclude this verbal launch session. I want to thank all who attended and Dr. Lucy for coming to speak for us today. Thank you.